before we get into the physiology and what's happening to these various sex hormones that's kind of underpinning a lot of what we're talking about i i want to kind of understand the human experience here so you're you're a woman you you work clinically uh as an endocrinologist and um you know we were chatting off air we had a, a laugh my mo- my mother has seen you at some point um so there's a bit of a connection there so you would hear a lot of stories and um you're connected not just to the data that we see and you know if you give someone estrogen plus progestogen, what's the outcomes? That's really interesting and helps us, you know, make uh, a good sort of risk benefit calculation. But from a human experience side, take us inside a woman's life, her mind, as she's transitioning through perimenopause. She's experiencing changes physiologically. How is this manifesting? in terms of how she feels about herself, what her world view is, how that's changing, where she fits in, uh, her connections with family or disconnections with, with family. I'd love to explore that. So there's a huge range of experiences and I think that's incredibly critical to understand. And some people become zealots about their experience and write a book and expect everyone to identify with their experience. And I think that can be really helpful, but it can also be confusing. Some women will just, so 25% of women have virtually no symptoms, 20 to 25%. It's not a big deal. Doesn't mean that there aren't changes that are affecting their biology that we can talk about separately, but for about 20 to 25%, it's not a drama. They don't get anxious. They don't get depressed. Their sleep's not different. And then there are the women who have migraines every month or, and then suddenly they're like, oh, this is such a relief. And that's despite if you drew their blood, you would see a very similar hormone profile. Yep. Yep. And there are other women who, um, that, you know, the classic symptoms are hot flushes and night sweats. And then I have patients who say, I've never had a hot flush. Do you feel like hot? Oh, I'm just hot all the time. So even the way women will describe their experience of the heat is variable. Some women have terrible flushes during the day, but not at night. Other women literally have to change their bed clothes because they've sweated so much on their sheets, they're lying in the puddle. Um, I think women... Our research has shown that women understand this. I think one of the more, dare I say, even more sinister symptoms that women often do not relate to menopause is anxiety. Irritability they get, you know, they often talk about the seven dwarfs, the sort of the grumpy, the bitchy, the this and that. But anxiety can be a real symptom of menopause where women become irrationally anxious about something minor, panic attacks, and women don't link that to their menopause. So they don't, the trigger, the bells don't ring and they don't, the trigger doesn't go off. Um, so they feel alone, vulnerable because they don't know what's going on with their body. So a lot of how women experience the menopause, if, if you're empowered with knowledge about what may happen, you can say, oh, this is happening to me, I understand why it's happening. If you don't know why it's happening or what to expect, it's a very frightening and lonely experience. Mm-hmm. Do you think women feel embarrassed? I think it depends on the degree of knowledge a woman has and her social group in terms of family, friends and work. So some, and, and the confidence of that individual. Um, I think where women commonly feel embarrassed today is um, taking HRT. So I still have patients who say, I don't tell anybody I'm taking HRT because they're all going to come at me about, oh, you shouldn't be on that. Did you know it causes breast cancer? Blah, blah, blah. I find women are more embarrassed about that than actually mentioning to friends how they feel. Quick one, folks. I get asked all the time about buying supplements and getting blood tests. The good news is I've created comprehensive and completely free guides for both. Simply head over to my website, theproof.com, to download them. That's theproof.com. Okay, 
let's get back to the episode. How, how good are the available interventions and the, the recommendations that we have for, what? So to, for, 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 uh, for what we're talking about at the moment in terms of the hot flushes, the changes in, in libido or mood, these more acute things as a woman is going through the perimenopause does, if she is one of those, I think you said 25% experience very little symptoms, but if, if she is one of those that is experiencing symptoms, does she have to experience those symptoms? Is that, is that a given for her? Okay, so there's a lot of talk about the perimenopause and the menopause. There are many women who actually don't have terrible symptoms in the perimenopause, but because their ovaries are intermittently working. And soon as they hit the menopause and their ovaries, their estrogen just drops through the floor. That's when their symptoms are horrible. So there is a variation as the timing of individuals. So let's talk about the postmenopause. A woman's ovaries have stopped working. Hot flushes, night sweats, vaginal dryness, sleep disturbance, anxiety, low mood. I'm saying low mood, not clinical depression. Estrogen is incredibly effective at alleviating those symptoms. What's the difference between low mood and clinically diagnosed depression? Uh, clinically diagnosed depression is really continuous um, loss of the ability to find pleasure, to black mood. Um, I mean, there is some at least two weeks of you know, severe down mood, nothing makes you happy, you don't want to get out of bed, you want you can't communicate with people. It's it's profoundly severe. Now it may be exacerbated by the menopause. But before you just throw hormones and say that you should be responding, we, you know, there are people with clinical depression who are not going to get back get well with hormones. And so it's a very um important thing that if mood doesn't improve with hormones then you need to start looking at other more profound depressive illness but moving away from that you know low mood um just not feeling women will say i've lost my mojo i i'm just not as happy they're not not getting out of bed they're just saying i'm just not happy i'm not laughing as much i'm anxious i'm irritable that's very responsive now and that's Fairly straightforward to treat in most circumstances. But when we're talking about the perimenopause, women are intermittently making an egg and having their own bleed. And the hormones are going up and down. So one day the estrogen is extremely low and the next day it's extremely high. One day they're sweating and the next day they've got sore breasts and bleeding. If you give standard HRT to that patient, on the days where their estrogen's mm. high, you can actually make it worse. Right. So it's much harder to intervene if it's being very volatile. Yeah. And there you can actually worsen symptoms. Does that happen? Would 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 anyone prescribe at that that Well, phase some people do, life? and you can actually in the old days we used to, and we used to find we often make symptoms worse. And what we also do is we cause the onset of a bleed with our artificial regimen. And then they ovulate and have a bleed. And then they're bleeding and not bleeding. And then they don't know when they're bleeding. And so this, and also at this time, women often need contraception. So a common practice in Australia is to give a low dose oral contraceptive pill. And we're very fortunate that we have contraceptive pills here that contain the identical estrogen that we give as HRT. So we, there's a whole range of things we can do that will give cycle control contraception and symptom relief that is not yet HRT. Right. Okay. So perimenopause, different set of interventions yes. than the postmenopausal period yes. uh, phase. And just to kind of, I guess, umbrella everything we're talking about here, it seems like there's kind of two big bucket buckets. Correct me if I'm wrong. You have those more acute symptoms that we're thinking about trying to manage to to make uh, that that woman's life more uh, bearable, enjoyable, quality of life going through it. And then there's also, we think we're forecasting out. So we spoke earlier about it's not natural to necessarily be living to 80 to 90 as, as a result of going or uh, reaching menopause, being in the postmenopausal phase 
these changes in hormones can predispose you to risk of different chronic conditions. Can can we kind of uh, just further define that? What are those chronic conditions? You sort of said estrogen goes off the cliff. So if a woman's listening um, and she's one of those that's fortunate not to have the acute symptoms, so thinking, okay, well, I got lucky, I'll just go through, I don't need to worry about any type of intervention. What I'm hearing is, well, actually, you'd still want to pay attention because even though you're not experiencing symptoms, your hormones have changed and you could be placing yourself at increased risk of certain conditions later in life. Before we get there, though, you do need to be aware that a lot of women think, oh, these symptoms are terrible, but I don't need to take anything because they'll be gone in six months. 42% of women aged 60 to 64 are still having hot flashes and night sweats. So although we describe them as acute, those terrible symptoms can last for decades. I see patients in their 70s who are still having hot flashes and night sweats. And just assume it's normal. Although they just think it's terrible, but they... They have to put up with it. Or we treat them for it. But but what I'm saying is for many women, the symptoms are – the average duration of symptoms is at least seven years. So um, if a woman's having bad symptoms, a woman shouldn't think they're just going to go in a few months because they're probably not just going to go in a few Mm, months. That's a good point. But for the woman not having symptoms, the changes that occur at menopause is bone loss. So even a woman with no symptoms – on average, women lose about 6% of their bone over that two or three years of transition. Is that primarily because estrogen falls Because estrogen is falling. Right. Um, women's cholesterol levels can change, so their cardiovascular disease risk changes. Mm-hmm. As in it goes up. It goes up. Women overall don't tend to gain weight but even if without any weight gain women tend to accumulate central abdominal fat when you accumulate more fat around your tummy that's bad fat which is associated with inflammation cardiovascular disease risk diabetes and some cancers Mm -hmm. including breast cancer so is that again that's that's hormone hormone dependent right so on average women increase their central abdominal fat by about 20 to 40 percent mm-hmm. you wrote a paper on that um right that we've described that but there's actually studies that have specifically shown that, that that's not my research that they've used um techniques to actually show changes doing doing um scans annually across the transition and showing how much abdominal fat there is and women's inc- risk of diabetes goes up So estrogen has incredibly important actions in terms of metabolic health and how insulin acts in the body. So when estrogen levels drop, women become more resistant to the effects of insulin and so their risk of diabetes increases. So let's dive into estrogen and sex hormones a little bit more here. So uh, ovaries, adrenals, where are the sex hormones being produced, uh, estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, and and perhaps just kind of an, an overview of how they're changing through this period? So women have two major sources of their sex hormones. They have their ovaries and their adrenals. Now, the ovaries produce hormones with every menstrual cycle, and the main ones we talk about are estrogen, progesterone, which is the hormone that creates the possibility of pregnancy, and testosterone. And it is normal for a woman to produce testosterone from her ovaries. And in fact, testosterone gets converted into estrogen. So testosterone in the ovary gets made into estrogen in the ovary, and that helps with fertility. Meanwhile, while the ovaries are doing their things, we've got the adrenal glands producing sex hormones the most well-known of which is DHEA. DHEA is released from the adrenal glands, runs around in the blood, and is taken up by other tissues, fat tissues notably, but also the brain, even the ovaries. And in those tissues, DHEA is converted into estrogen and testosterone. So what happens is you've got the woman premenopausally, ovaries, androge- ovaries, and the adrenals, all giving her her hormones. 
when the ovaries stop working at menopause or if they're surgically removed, a woman still has her adrenals. They continue to release DHEA, which then in tissues is made into testosterone and estrogen, some of which just only acts in those tissues and some of which spills over into the bloodstream and goes into other tissues. Right. But because the ovaries are no longer producing estrogen, that's why you get a, a, a net decrease. You get a net decrease. So you get a major loss of estrogen, but the, ov the adrenals still produce quite a lot of hormone that will sustain biological function. Now, adrenal health varies between women. People often talk about this thing called adrenal fatigue. You have to have pretty rubbish adrenals for them not to be producing enough. I think I've seen someone hormone. post online that if you drink a couple of cups, cups of coffee a day, you might get adre adrenal yeah. fatigue. <laughs> adrenal fatigue is sort of this wishy-washy thing that unfortunately people with fatigue are then told they've got adrenal fatigue and they're putting on, on, on DHEA or other things to, to boost their adrenals. And it's a lot of nonsense, really. Um, the amount of DHEA that's produced is in buckets loads. There's plenty in everybody unless you've got adrenal failure. <laughs>